Really think about how the husband is supposed to love his wife, and now how the husband and wife are supposed to build their home as God is their foundation. And when we see people nowadays building their homes, building their families up, what do we see? Like Sister Gilson said, well, always about the money. Going into the relationship is what? It's about the money. What else do we see? Sex. Folks build relationships off of sex. Sex, money. Oddly enough, drugs. <laughs> You see a whole lot of things other than Christ. See, you see a whole lot of things other than Christ. And this lesson is telling us sanctification and cleansing of Christ's church leads to his glorification in the midst of a world characterized by sin. Glorification in the midst of a world characterized by sin. Let me break down and put it to you like this. Regardless of what goes on in the world, regardless of the fashion trend, of all these things our kids get into, all the things that we get into, our Christian households are still supposed to have a foundation of Christ. In the midst of a world of sin, we are supposed to be different. Different in the meaning that Christ is supposed to be our foundation. Simply meaning you can't do everything that the world does. I ain't saying that last night you had to be sitting in the church when the new year came in. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Been there and done that. Because if you was a hell cat and demon before the new year came in, you still a hell cat and demon now. So sitting in there prophet line, talking about 2023, they ain't do you no good. So all I'm saying is this. Your foundation should have been Christ before 12 o'clock. And if your foundation in the household wasn't built upon Christ before 12 o'clock, guess what? 2023 is just going to be much of the same old song. What is our foundation built upon? Because I'm still saved in Holy Ghost fear, regardless if I was in church last night or not. And I wasn't in church, I was popping fireworks for my family. But that we still gave reverence to God. Let me get my mic right quick. But that is what we have to do. We have to give reverence to God in all aspects of our relationships. And see, in verse 28, the Apostle Paul emphasizes the basic foundations that God put in place. Look at this for Adam and Eve. Adam declared Eve as his bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh represents forcefully a unique kind of spiritual and bodily union. It also symbolizes Adam's love for his wife. And without any reservation, he understood that his wife was part of his own spiritual, physical, psychological, and emotional what? Well-being. This is a part of me. This is my real. And the two key words in these verses, when we look at them, is nourish, uh, nourish, and uh, cherish. And so the word nourish also means providing substance and attending carefully to others' needs. It means that the husband is called to participate in the personal life of his wife. DJ, I'm going to put you on the spot real quick. Well, I'm going to put myself on the spot too. We are called to participate in the personal life of our wives. DJ, what do you think that means? We got to participate in the personal life of our wives. And when it's not needed. 
So it don't mean you got to dominate. Wait a minute. Do you have to check her Snapchat? You got to check and see what she be looking at on TikTok. You ain't got to check her text messages. Okay. Y'all going to laugh. Do you got to go to the bathroom with her? Oh, okay. All right, then. I'm, I'm just asking because, see, I'm just asking because some people get it so twisted and act like you just got to hoard and look over where you going, what time you coming back, what you going to do, who was you with. <laughs> if she reverences God, y'all know God is your foundation. Brother, I ain't got nothing to be worried about. If you told me you was going out with your sisters, and I get through looking at Netflix, Peacock, Prime, or whatever I'm looking at, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sleep. And when you get back, <laughs> honey, I'm home. You have a good time? Yeah, we had a good time. Okay. Good night. I'm going back to sleep. Hmm? Right. You know what your foundation is. But see, that's why I asked earlier, um, when we look at these families today, their foundations is not built upon Christ. Their foundations is built upon all these other worldly issues and things, which turns into what? So, Cerise, I got to worry about what time she coming in. I got to worry about where she was. I got to check 360 and see where she at. Oh, you turn 360 out. Why you turn 360 out? Where you been? <laughs> That's just too much drama for me. If our source, if a woman knows her source is a husband, a husband knows his source, who's ahead of him is Christ. And I'm performing my leadership role taking care of my wife. Those are things I don't have to be concerned about. You don't have to be concerned about those things. When we look at the word nourish, it means that the husband is called to participate in the personal life of his wife. He is to meet her holistic needs in a manner that brings about, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Dick James, we might have to look back at this. It says he's to meet her needs in a manner that brings about progress in the marriage relationship, wait a minute, as ordained by God. How can you have progress, sisters, if you always worried about this stuff? You ain't progressing nowhere. However, this idea does not mean that a wife is what? Inferior to the husband. There it is again. She's not inferior. Second, the, the, the use of the word cherish, the writer is referring to a husband's promise to his wife to nurture, protect, and shelter her in what? Some situations? All situations. In a marriage relationship and a Christian family that thrives on mutual support are informed and what? Influenced by God's way of expressing love. Now that's a strong household. When a marriage and a family thrives off of mutual support and are, you are informed and you are influenced by God's way of expressing love. Marriage has been presented as the fundamental relationship between a man and a woman. It requires characteristics of what? Devotion that inspire what? Self-sacrifice, deep affection, and what? Total commitment. Think about your relationship with Christ. What does it require? Characteristics of what? Devotion, and it inspires what? Self-sacrifice. It also has what? Deep affection. And then lastly, it has what? Total commitment. 
Now, ain't that interesting? Your life with Christ reflects the same thing that your marriage should be reflecting. Isn't that interesting? And if you leave some of that out, what you think gonna happen to your marriage? Anybody? If you leave that out of your relationship with Christ, what do you think gonna happen? The new bond that marriage involves transcends any attachment. Man, I think this is where I'm gonna get myself in trouble at. <laughs> the bond that marriage involves and, and transcends any attachment or commitment to other forms of relationships. Anything, people must do what? Leave anything except worshiping God that stands between the love relationship between what? Husband and wife. And this word joining in this context is a work of God's grace. It, also, it, it, it is also the corresponding responsibility of the man and woman who are involved in the marriage to mutually extend their love and personality to each other in a special manner based on love. Where a lot of people get themselves in trouble is this next line here. Because they have become one flesh. <laughs> they don't. They are bonded together in a corporal relationship and are sustained by mutual respect and love for each other. Each person completely needs the other. You are joined one. And this joining is a work of God's grace. You must leave any other relationships except for worshiping God. And you must put your marriage first. Now really, what does that entail? Anybody want to talk about one? What does that really entail? Come on, anybody? Sister Colleen, you got nothing to say? What does that really entail? When you become one, God together. Go ahead, the word of God together. It makes you strong. Hmm. It makes the marriage get stronger. That's more. What else? Well, I say what else. Can't really add anything else onto that. <laughs> Where we mess up as, and I was speaking at Deacon James about earlier, you know, checking to me because phone and all this stuff. And I've heard this before, you know. In marriage, we're one, but we're one in our union to Christ. That does not mean that we got to check up on each other all the time. Let me go to my rap days. That does not mean when I move, you move. Just like that. <laughs> That's not what that means. We are one in our union to Christ. We're one in our mutual respect for one another. We're one in our foundation of Christ in our lives. But Paul goes on to say here, this is the great mystery of God's plan. This marriage relationship, it's a great mystery. Of God, just like God's plan of salvation. And so this love cannot be fully grasped by the power of our mind. Without what? The help of the Holy Spirit. So when you look at this union and we become one, look at what it says there now. You can't fully grasp that without the help of the Holy Spirit. So when you think about it in a secular sense, people say, well, we won. 
What does that mean? What does that mean? That I got to follow you, that I got to check up on you, that I got to make sure you here and make sure you there? Man, you are stretching the word all night. You can fully grasp the understanding of this by the help of the Holy Spirit. It's a great mystery. But in a marriage, I know that I'm one with my wife. And that's not by me having to keep up with her either. We're one in Christ. And what, knowing that Christ is our foundation, that's what everything is built upon, our family. You know, everything that we do, a move that we make, is built upon what? Christ. And my wife, knowing that I'm her source and I'm knowing that I'm in a position of leadership, I know that I got to lead my family in accordance to who? Christ. And knowing that I'm doing that, it does not make it hard for my wife to submit and follow me. Don't make it hard at all. <laughs> do we disagree sometimes? Yes, we do. Do we fuss and fight sometimes? Yes, we do. But guess what? She ain't divorcing me. <laughs> Deacon Jane, we ain't going to the court out tomorrow. We ain't going to file no papers. <laughs> Before we lay down, we're going to roll on. <laughs> and I'm going to roll over and snore and go on by my business. And wake up in the morning, good morning, baby, how you doing? <laughs> and roll on. Because your foundation has to be in who? Christ. You know your real relationship with Christ. It's not just for today. You're supposed to have a lifelong relationship with Christ. Same thing in your marriage. You're supposed to have what? A lifelong relationship. So let's move on. So it's Colleen, your children, my children, and Jace, all y'all, y'all probably going to be mad right by now because now we got to deal with these kids. <laughs> children should be obedient and loved. One of my youth, y'all got a Sunday school book. I want, I want one of my youth to read those verses. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Come on, Candace, you ain't shy. Don't read. You just read to me. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Oh, children, obey their parents and the Lord for the right. Keep it, I keep going. Yes, mom. Oh, okay. Honor the Father and Mother wish. First commitment with promise that it may be will with thee and though may life live long on the earth and ye father not your children to worry but bring up bring them up in the nature and admonition of the Lord. Look back at verse three, what's this candidate read? That it may be well with thee. That they may as what? Live long on earth. And ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of who? The Lord. In this context, Paul now lays out reciprocal duties and responsibilities between parents and children. Now, as I stated earlier, in verse 22, Paul says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, y'all notice I said earlier, he didn't give no requirement to the wife on submission, did he? Because look what he adds in there after that comma, as unto the Lord. So, wives, you submit yourself to the Lord. What happens next? Shouldn't have no problem submitting yourself to your husband. And then when you go on down, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself, what? For it. So he said, Wives, submit yourself to your husband as unto the Lord. Then he tells the husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ. Love the church. 
But now skip down to Ephesians 6 and 1. What does he say? Children, obey your parents in the Lord for what? This is right. Hmm. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with what? Promise. Children were instructed to obey their parents, similar to the preceding exhortation that was given to the wives to submit to their husbands. Children have been instructed to honor thy father and mother through an appeal of Old Testament scripture in verse two. First, it is right for children to obey their parents. In what? In the Lord. Second, Paul reminds children that the Old Testament commandment quoted in this passage was the only one that had a promise attached to it. On one hand, the word right is, is present because it was proper. And that's decided for children to obey their, their parents. On the other hand, the word promise brings encouragement to the children that their obedience to parents was both personal and has community implications. Because children listen to their parents, they are able to do what? Live good lives. And this line of action will prevent the children from falling prey to what? Temptations and lifestyles that may be destructive to what? Their well-being. Children, this is why it's so important for you to obey and listen to your parents. Christ is our foundation. And if I'm leading and guiding my household according to his will, and my wife is following me according to his will, what do you think we're supposed to be doing with our children? Teaching our children to follow what? His will. And so when parents see danger and we try to warn our children, it's vitally important that you do what? Listen, because we are trying to guide our household in accordance to who? God's plan. But not only should children listen and obey, in terms of community life, children's disobedience to parents may lead to a breakdown of what? Family bonds that eventually result in what? Destruction. And Sister Go, she touched on it last week, I believe. You know, we see a lot of breakdown in our families of children not respecting their parents and, and all these different things. But as Sister Go said last week, it goes back to the parents. What are the parents teaching the children? Why are they allowing them to be so disrespectful? Is it because our foundation is not Christ? Is it because our foundation and our families is not Christ? But next we see parents have been instructed not to what? Provoke. I've heard so many children try to use this against, you know, against their parents, as a colleague, when, when they can't have what they want. You provoking me to anger. Because <laughs> they can't have their way. But let's look at this. The etymology of the word provoke carried a sense of capriciousness, domineering, and self-scratch, exercise of authority by parents on their children. Parents were instructed not to put what? Unreasonably harsh demands or expectations on their children, to refrain from always being negative and condemning, and to treat their children fairly without what? Humiliating them. Do not provoke them. We're not supposed to put unreasonable demands on them or expectations. Cleaning up your room is not unreasonable and harsh. <laughs> 
let's break it down. Who slept in the bed? Okay, let me break it down a little further. Who bought the mattress? Who bought, washed the sheets? <laughs> Who gave you the roof over your head? Christ is our source now. So is it unreasonable when you get up in the morning, make up your bed? That ain't it unreasonable. When you go to school, make sure you do your homework. That's not unreasonable. Summertime, Jace, go mow the yard. <laughs> that ain't unreasonable. <laughs> That's just an example of some things that should not be provoking you to anger. Not the way that you want to use it. See, parents were instructed not to put unreasonably harsh demands or expectations on their children. I got another one for you. If I'm a doctor, which I'm not, but if I'm a doctor and I'm trying to send my kids to school to be a doctor, but they ain't want to be no doctor, they want to be an artist, Y'all think that's unreasonable or harsh? Yes, it is. That's putting unreasonable expectations on our child because that's not what they really want to do. We forcing them to do something that we want them to do. That's not for the benefit of them, that's for the benefit of us. So we have to be mindful on really what we pushing our kids in. Now, if they want to go out there in the screen and be a drug dealer, I don't think so. Now, you ain't finna do that. <laughs> but when we nurture our kids, we should listen to what they want to do, what they have to say, and give them guidance. Parents should be intentional. Look at this now. We should be intentional in training educating, nurturing, and loving our children. By the Lord's assistance, parents prepare children for what? Success in both secular and Christian communities. Therefore, parents are responsible to love, discipline, teach, and care for their children in a way that brings what? That sells it all right there. We should be responsible to love, discipline, teach, and care for our children in a way that brings glory to God. If it doesn't bring glory to God, we missing it. We should teach them things. We should discipline them. We should care for them. Christ is our foundation. And if we govern our house accordingly, you will see nothing but blessings. You will see nothing but blessings. And as we close, in our post-Christian culture, we are witnessing the breakdown of the family unit. Marriages are disintegrating. Children are disobedient and disrespectful to their parents and others in authority. Families are important to God. And when you look at the makeup of a church, a church is made up of what? Individuals, but a church is also made up of families. And when you look at the body of Christ, it's a family. Ain't nothing about the body of Christ a solo act. We're all members of the body. So families are important to God. He created them. Look at Adam and God created what? Families first. He also laid out specific principles for creating a loving, harmonious family life. When we live according to these principles, a godly family is the result. And a godly, harmonious family is a living testimony to Christ's love for what? The church. 
Families are important to God. So I would say, if it wasn't in 2022 or years past, but for 2023, forget all the other whatever y'all gonna be wishing on. Make sure your family is rooted and grounded in Christ. Make sure your family is rooted and grounded and watch everything else blossom. Your family, your man, watch everything else blossom if you do that. So next Sunday, we will talk about proclaiming Christ. Proclaiming Christ. By background, we come from the Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 30. Printed text, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. Our devotional reading comes from Psalms chapter 119, uh, verses 169 through 176. And I aim for change, we will comprehend Paul's message of joy in the proclamation of the gospel of Christ, reflect on a variety of motives for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and fashion a personal proclamation of the gospel. Thank you all for attending Sunday school this morning. I pray that you got something out of this lesson this morning, talking about Christ's love. So may God bless you. May God keep you all.